Mycology for Fungi Friday. So we're doing a mycology Q&A with Zach from Mushroom Cult. Um, we've got our, our class schedule up for the year. They're filling up pretty quickly. So if you're looking to take our hands-on course, um, we're doing that two-day courses um, from now and through April. And you can find the location on mushroomcult.net. Um, and let us know if you can hear us. I'm, I've got some new microphones I'm testing out. And I'm getting a new laptop soon, which should help out with making these a little bit better. But, um, yeah, so is there any updates on anything that you've got going on or um, what have you been up to lately? I think this, the class schedule is the newest thing. Um, I kind of took summer off. And starting up in just a couple of weeks with the first two-day in-person class in Denver, Colorado. And then we're putting a couple online classes. We'll probably do four of them, but two of them have not been decided if they're just going to be general cultivation classes or if we're going to do something a little um, more in-depth or outside of the box. I'm still trying to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, so if you guys have any suggestions for... Um, any different types of classes that you'd like us to cover, either online or in person. I know I've gotten some suggestions for doing a breeding class or some uh, more, you know, technical laboratory skills. Uh, our class is pretty extensive. We cover that briefly, but maybe we can do something a little bit more thorough. Um, but yeah, any suggestions are appreciated um, if you just want to comment below. But um, give us a thumbs up if you can hear us. Um, I don't have any way to check on the audio. So just give us a thumbs up if you can hear us clearly. Yeah, if you can hear us, um, let us know with thumbs up or whatever. Um, maybe you scoot a little bit closer to me. Yeah, this, this yeah that's a good one. Yeah, All we're right. live on TikTok and is this YouTube? Yep, yeah, so we got YouTube, TikTok, and it's going to be um, a post on YouTube as soon as we're done with this so everyone can kind of view what we're discussing but all right so anyone have some questions no questions yet a lot of people joining in mm -hmm. um, let's see if we can access the chat all right so we did get a thumbs up welcome to the chat we'll just wait for a few more people to join I guess we cover the um, class schedule. So the latest updates on my end, I recently built a hoop house for some Morcella, uh, Morcella and Portuna. So this is going to be my third go around at attempting to cultivate morel mushrooms. Um, so essentially I just built a hoop house and I tilled in a bunch of um, the scraps from the garden this year. So I grew a bunch of sunflower seeds and then um, Zach helped me mulch them down and I tilled them into the soil and then I created two um, little, I guess, raised areas inside the bed. And then I took the the mycology blocks that, ha that contained oak sawdust and oats and the mycelium from the morels and then I sliced the sides open and planted them on top and the idea is that the mycelium will travel into the soil and then it will freeze at some point this winter which is supposed to trigger the pinning and then in the spring I'm going to set up a system to maintain 60 percent moisture content in the soil and then hopefully we'll get some pins so um, last spring I got a couple pins um, questionably and they just never developed into a fruiting body so I reached out to Blue's Best over in Iowa and he said that they probably just got too dry so they're very sensitive um, which is pretty crazy that we get morels in nature because they were very promising but I think that they're just too exposed and they never develop um, but yeah so yeah, I'm going to try something um, a little bit opposite. Gary gave me a block, and so I'm going to mix it into my soil, just spread it out and mix it in. And in the spring, I'll put some nutrient blocks on top that have no mycelium in it and see if that does something different. Cool. Yeah, so then there, I've seen that method um, where people have the mycelium travel to the nutrients, and then from that area, they'll get fruits. 
I saw someone else, they used apples, so they would just place apples on top of the soil, and you could see the mycelium, like, encase these apples. Um, and then there's a method in Trad Cotter's book where someone would dig trenches, and then they put sa sand layers in between the spawn and the morels, and then they would put, like, a leaf duff on top, and they would get them to fruit that way. So it seems like there's... Um, some pretty promising methods it's just I, I feel like it's very genetic dependent and I've got about six different strains now in culture and this is uh, the most promising to me because it has like little sclerotia on the petri dish um, so that seemed you know pretty promising I saw someone on the internet had morel fruiting bodies in a petri dish so if anyone has that culture let me know <laughs> all right Maybe got some questions coming in. All right. So someone says you can't see the other guy if you want to get into that frame, but I feel like um, you can be seen. Nobody really <laughs> wants to see me anyway. <laughs> All right. The real question is if anyone can hear us, but apparently we're uh, we're still gathering attention. So. Yeah, maybe, maybe no one can hear us. Then. Yeah. One person on my on my TikTok. Maybe there's no sound. All right, well, we got some people joining in, mm -hmm. um, so I guess we'll just uh, move on. So I, I did find this cool paper about the cultivation of Tricholoma matutaki. So this summer, Zach um, gave me a, a taste test of the Tricholoma, what was it, Lactiflorum? The orange um, ones that turned oh, green? So, so that was a... Uh, that was, uh... Lactarius. Lactarius, yeah. So that kind of turned me on to some other species besides the porcini and the morels, which I usually um, stick to those two because I know them. But um, I did some research, and William Padilla Brown had been doing this cook off with matsutake mushrooms, so it kind of piqued my interest. And one of our certified foragers from the West Coast got a really nice. Uh, um, batch of button matsutake so i recently cloned that and i'm doing some spore prints right now and um i found this paper about um the the different methods of cultivating um tricholoma matsutake which is one of the most prized mushrooms in japan in this paper it says it can go up up to fourteen hundred dollars per kilogram which that's pretty insane um but anyway, there was a couple different methods for getting it onto um, agar. It's very interesting because it's, it is a, a hypermorphic mycelium. So I forgot what they, what they described it as, but when the spores germinate, it starts as a diploid. And then a single hyphae can grow out of that diploid and transfer nucleus into itself so it can be it can go from diploid to tetroid or tetraploidy um, on its own which means that it can self-replicate within one spore which is pretty unique um, to other mushrooms um, it seemed like it does this because it grows in very rough conditions like um, it seems like it prefers sandy soil, very dry conditions, unlike most mushrooms. And maybe that that has something to do with it because it's going to try to um, preserve its own genetics rather than waiting for another spore to germinate, which might be more difficult than other mushrooms. Um, I wish I had highlighted more of this stuff. But it seemed like... Um, for spore isolation, they were using typical agar, but they put um, extracts from the pine needles. So, do you know what a red pine is from Japan? Mm. Yeah, that's not not in Colorado. Yeah, we don't have that. Um, but in Colorado, mm -hmm. the foragers have been collecting it off of um, off of lodgepole pine this nice. season. Um, I've heard of it being on uh, Ponderosa, but all the videos I saw of the collections, 
Yeah, so it seems to be hypermorphic, though. There are other trees that they tried to grow it on, and they had some success. There's a... I wish I had read this more than once, but... But yeah, so well-drained, nutrient-poor for, forest soil, um, and a lower pH for the auger. At some point, it said 3 to 4 pH, which is pretty low. Normally, mushrooms grow at 7, so I don't know if I'm going to get any type of growth on that dish. But oh yeah, 4.5 to 5, Matsutakis appear on nutrient poor soils such as granite, sandstone, which are acidic, 4.4 to or 4.5 to 5, which makes sense because all the pine needles are breaking down at the roots of the tree. Um, yeah, that's what a lot of the mountain soils are here. It's it's like decomposed granite, so really mm -hmm. kind of sandy, coarse sand, and then there's a lot of um, there's a thick layer of organic material on the surface that's mostly pine needles and pine cones. But then there's also we have things like maple. We have um, wax flower. We have lots of uh, small perennials and grasses that in that are part of that duff layer. Mm -hmm. So it says for spore germination, um, low germination rate for basidio spores. Um, extracts of needles of pine densiflora stimulated germination, as well as N-butyric acid in agar. Um, and then, yeah, once again, the pH range between 3 and 4. They did get germination, mm -hmm. and vegetative growth was possible, pH 5 to 6. Um, there's more specific nutrient makeup in this paper, mm -hmm. but essentially three or four people have done it since 1976. Um, there was one that did not use trees, so... They are mycorrhizal, which requires the, the roots of the trees, but someone did a, a bed method. So they did mix in extracts from pine needles, though, probably to lower the pH, and it gave it some type of nutrients that it's getting from the tree. But anyway, there's uh, this paper that came out in last January, if anyone wants to check it out. Um, but I'm just going to try to get it onto auger and then put it in a liquid culture and just spray it all over my property and hopefully something takes mm -hmm. yeah yeah this is great um i was wanting to talk about learning just as a topic is that is that what else is on your list there yeah just whatever oh yeah and then i did get an albino maitake from new york um so shout out to alex from farmhouse fungi he sent me a, a tissue sample in the mail and I just got um, one of the clones to start taking off on PDA. So it's very unique white maitake. Mm -hmm. um, and I did get some spores on that too. But he wanted to cultivate it first. And then our long-term plan is to sequence the white one um, genetically and then sequence a traditional maitake genetically. And then maybe we can discover the differences in the genomes and figure out what would make a maitake albino and that could be something exciting to get other albino species but um that was just a kind of an off topic that um, i didn't really post any videos on this but shout out to alex he had taken our class previously so it's kind of exciting to follow up with our former students and just um, stay active in the community mm -hmm. yep but yeah so as far as learning goes, um, I'm, I'm excited to start teaching these classes again just because um, I feel like I learn every time that we gather together. But um, I don't know, is there anything specific that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, just like what, what is the, the process of learning? Um, I guess we could briefly talk about the class. Um, the idea of the class is really to walk somebody through from beginning to end, a lot of the technical lab procedures uh, talk about some of the, the shortcuts and really do a, a kind of a personal training. It's, um, we, we try to set people up so that they can understand mycology as a concept or microbiology more, more generally 
so that when you grab books or you go onto theshroomery.com or you're just searching through the internet, you can understand this code language that all these um, hobby micro mycologists are using um, so that you know what it's like to put that into practice in real life. And you can also understand the language that's being used. Um, and we like to walk somebody through that whole process so that you have done the entire thing yourself. So you have that, that memory, that, um, that uh, what do you call it? I guess the practice, the, the experience mm -hmm. of, of go going through the whole thing. And we are, we're also there watching your procedure because a lot of uh, the lab procedures are really technical body movements and uh, order of operations. And we're watching so that you can make your natural mistakes and we can point them out so that you can learn faster than if you have to go through the whole process and find out it failed. Go through the whole process, failed again. We might be able to point out some of those errors that you wouldn't notice until you've failed a few times. So we're trying to speed up that learning process. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm just real, realizing that I need to keep learning. Um, we've taught this class many times. The last few years we've, we've run through, I don't know, 20, 30 classes. Um, and it's, it's a lot of the same material. We're, we've been reiterating it and improving it every time. But I'm, I'm starting to realize that I need to learn things that I don't know. Um, we could keep teaching the class as it is. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot to microbiology. There's, there's millions of different organisms that interact with mushrooms. Um, there's chemistry. Chemistry is the building block of what a mushroom is. Um, we, we are chemistry. We're walking chemistry, um, physics, um, just like other, other genuses and other uh, families of organism, plants, how, like what we're talking about with the Matsutake, they generally are paired up with trees. How do you grow trees? It's, it's more than just the lab procedures. A lot of the lab procedures for the mushrooms wouldn't really apply to growing pine trees. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about learning about a pinion or a pinion pine tree or or a lodgepole pine tree um, this was a great example I, I was um, last year someone sent me some uh, some decaps which is a lactarious um, species and I scraped some spores off into several different medias and I got zero germination and one thing I didn't do was look up a paper that says, you know, here's the pH range, and here's some of the extracts, here's a couple of the ingredients that have helped other people do that. And it might work exactly the same, just copy this recipe for, for the lactarius, or um, maybe I just need to sit out in nature and see where do these lactarius live. Um, maybe test the soil there. Maybe there's a bac bacterial component. So how, how do you learn stuff that you don't know, is, is kind of what I'm thinking. What are, what are ways that you learn things that you don't know? Yeah, so my number one way is just by uh, taking action. So that can be pretty frustrating when you're growing mushrooms, especially if you don't have someone over your shoulder watching you. But I definitely am just to uh, put everything into one basket, do everything that I think will work, and then if there's a success, then I'll go off of that. But that is very you know resource-intensive. And there's a lot of failure involved with that. So when I'm doing my research, um, I like to go to these journals. So my, my main source is um, Sci-Hub, which you can type in the, the name of any paper. So first I'll Google, find a bunch of papers. Some of them are, they have a paywall behind them. So you can um, go on Sci-Hub. And then there's, it's a nonprofit that gives you access to that paper. And then you can read about that. But there is a lot of, I would say, there's a lot of jargon in these papers that even I don't understand. So it could take, you know, 10 or 20 minutes just to read one page sometimes because I'm like, what is this? Like, I don't know what some of these trees are or what some of the regions of the world that these papers are taking place. So then I'll just break it down paragraph by paragraph, do my research, and then I like doing these videos because it kind of helps me regurgitate what I read and I realized that 
reading this paper one time did not do anything. <laughs> like I, I remember bits and pieces of it, but talking about it more, um, that helps me learn. So just communicating with other people, um, having a community like this on YouTube or TikTok really helps me learn. That's the number one reason why I do these videos is I feel like I'm providing value and then I'm getting value in return using this crazy technology that's available to all of us. So it's a slippery slope from being distracted to being, you know, engaged and learning. Um, so that is a, a hard part for me to balance like, all right, am I getting entertainment or am I getting value out of watching these videos? But um, I think videos and, you know, communicating back and forth is a good way to learn. And then on top of that, coming to our in-person classes, um, that's really helped me see different perspectives of the whole process. So, for instance, you know, there's people that when we're presenting on how to hold a Petri dish, they'll hold it a different way. And in my head, I'm like, wow, like that might actually be better than how I've been doing it all of these years. So there's, you know bringing new perspective into the same thing that you've been doing over and over again usually leads to more ideas and whether or not those ideas are better or worse just comes down to actually performing the task in that way and then looking at the results. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think um, getting a new perspective, there's lots of ways to get a different perspective, but as far as like, if you're trying to learn how to grow mushrooms the first time, um, taking a class is a great way to go. Mm -hmm. um, you can read read books. That that might be a little challenging translating that into real life. Um, but join a class. Um, we have a class, but I recommend that people take every class they, they can find. Uh, like there's one uh, online that's double blind. I think Michael Logos has some classes online. Here in Denver, there's a there's a guy in Boulder who teaches a really good class. Um, when I was starting this class, I went to every class that was being held in Denver, and um, none of the information was new, but the perspective was new, and I learned from that. If if I watch someone making a mistake, I learn from that. If I, um, you know, just just the fact that other people have different interests and things that they think are important that I I don't, watching someone emphasize a certain detail in a new way, I learn from that whether I agree with them or not. So I, I do recommend that you um, join a class, especially in person if you can. Um, but then YouTube, that's that's going to be my um, next dive into is, is just look who else is teaching mycology and put their video on 2x speed so I can get through these things. Because, <laughs> I mean, some people they just go on and on. So 2x speed, that's your friend. It's in the yeah. little menu. Myself included. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um cool maybe we could start fielding some of these questions oh yeah yeah do we have questions here all right so i apologize if uh the camera's sideways but this is my first time doing this in a while pretty rusty let's uh start seeing if we can turn it yeah. oh man look at that all right here let's see all right <laughs> yeah and this is uh we're just doing this in the garage, so mm -hmm. pretty makeshift. I'm waiting on a new computer. Probably should get some some tripods or something. But all right, let's do our best to go through some of these questions. Rotate video. All right, well, thank you. Dang, did it. All right, so someone asked, commercial grower near me sells chestnut and oak trees, which are fused with truffle, bolete, saffron, milk, clay caps after planting it will take f five to eight years for mushrooms um yeah so that is the idea that i've had for a while is kind of including like plant tissue culture and um, yeah let's see so yeah including like plant tissue culture and mushroom cultures if anyone's interested in that um you know stay tuned Let's see. All right, we're back to the chat. So what are your thoughts on purchasing or selling inoculated trees? Um, I think it would all be about 
you know, have other people succeeded with it because it's one thing to mix spawn into a nursery tree and quite another to really make sure that that bond between the mushroom and the tree is actually accomplished. So um, my thoughts are that you would want to start with a tree that does not have any uh, symbiotic relationships and introduce it to the mushroom to ensure that it, it's happening. So I imagine that you could have good truffle trees and bad truffle trees. So mm -hmm. um, make sure before you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on trees, make sure that you can talk to other people who have succeeded with it. Um, it's challenging because if you plant the tree, it could be five years before you see any results. So if you only buy one tree and you get results in five years, you're going to kick yourself for not buying $100,000 worth of those trees. Um, so basically, I would I would just make sure that they're a reputable company. Um, it is possible. There's uh, The truffle trees is a big thing. That's that's real. Um, I've heard about people in, um, in uh, New Zealand with the, the milk caps, saffron milk caps. Um, I don't know why it wouldn't be possible with really any mushroom. But make sure they're a reputable company before you're really spending money you can't afford to lose. Yeah, I would agree with that. All right, so we got some questions coming in. Um, so one of them is how to clean up cultures. So that's a pretty extensive process. Zach has a video on his YouTube channel. Um, do you want to describe that? how you clean up a culture so, so yeah different different processes yeah so i have a video it's called um spore cleanup number four uh, i did four videos of it and i found a plate that had some uh, penicillin mold in it and some mushroom mycelium so worst case normally you'd throw it away but if you have to clean it up uh, i just walk through the process of every step that i took and i did it in open air in my bathroom um I wouldn't rec if you're working with um, mold. I wouldn't do it in front of a flow hood. I would do it in a still air box because you don't want those spores getting wafted up into the air. So you need still air if you're trying to clean up a moldy culture. 